All right, welcome back. A very special guest joins us now, Tony Hager. He is a man that has created a legend around his ability to not only wrestle, but to beat those around the world and does so on a pretty regular basis. We haven't seen a lot of him lately, but I sure hope we get to see a lot of him in calendar year 2016. It's 2012 Olympic gold medalist Jordan Burroughs. How about that? Jordan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. Let's start uh, first off. Uh, congratulations on uh, the new baby. I understand you and, and your wife are expecting yet another new baby to join uh, Little Beacon. Yes, we are. Uh, June thirteenth is actually the due date. So my wife and I, right now, she's about thirteen weeks in her fr- first trimester still, and we're excited. We're excited about the opportunity to grow the Burroughs legacy and create a family, and for Beacon to have a possible new training partner. In the family and so you can't wrestle on your own you need someone to shoot some double legs on doubles i like that doubles he's in trouble with the double oh, yeah. and oh, yeah. lauren lauren's always uh, very supportive of uh, your wrestling career getting behind you 100 percent. i gotta believe that real positive uh attitude at home is a real good thing yeah for sure it's great i think it's awesome to have someone that's uh courageous but also inspiring behind you and so a lot of things that i think whether it's positive or negative, she's always a friendly reminder of where my goals and my integrity aligns and how I can keep a consistent focus on the things that I want to do and that I hope to do. And so she's really good to have around. She's an amazing woman, amazing mother, and she's a great wife. Do you, do you think you would still be you know, where you're at today wrestling uh, you know, without your family and your faith? Um, that's, that's hard. Yeah, that's hard. I was extremely successful before I, I was married and I think I've been successful afterward. And so there was a tough transitional period for me where essentially immediately after the marriage, I had the worst year of my international wrestling career. And then this past year, I've kind of settled into marriage, into fatherhood and was able to redeem myself, go undefeated and win a world title. And so, you know, it's all about perspective. It's all about adjustments, and I was able to do that. My wife understood the goals that I had, and she was able to to kind of give me the freedom to do the things I needed to do and the the sacrifices necessary to really keep wrestling at the highest level. And so that's a tough question. That's a tough question. I think I could have been, but I don't want to be. Hmm. That's a great okay. answer. It's, it's a, it is a great answer. Uh, all right, let's go to business if we can. Let's take go from family to business, and sometimes yes, the two do intertwine. Uh, you had a shoe deal, and uh, that kind of that whole thing kind of fell apart. So Asics came a calling, and they said, "Hey, we want you to be involved and to develop a line of shoes." Yeah. First of all, how did the conversation happen with uh, Nick Gallo? And let's talk about the end result as well, because I think it's some terrific product. And with your name on it, I gotta believe you endorse it a hundred percent. Yeah, for sure, I do. I think the relationship that I've established with Nick Gallo and the Asics Corporation has been extremely helpful in my career, and so it's allowed for me to be in a place financially where I don't have to think so much about making ends meet, so I can focus solely on wrestling. You know, they've got me set up in a place where I can have high quality gear unlimited amount of access to apparel and wrestling shoes and then also creating opportunities for me to really transition from just a wrestler to uh, transcend the sport and be a crossover athlete. I think they have the outreach as much as ASICS does in the wrestling community. They're a predominantly running company. So they have a dynamic of, of followers and fans that I really want to appeal to. And I think they've done a good job at marketing myself and their brand and the alignment that we've had with each other has been, I'd say, top notch. And so I'm very excited about our career going forward. Uh, we have a number of great products coming out very soon. The Olympic Games is going to be extremely fun to kind of see all the A6 athletes mingle and do their things together and hopefully bring home a lot of gold medals. And so, yeah, it's been great. Nick Gall is an awesome guy. Um, he's a friend of my family. He was at my wedding, and everyone at the A6 America Corporation out in Irvine, California, have done a good job, and they treated me like a high-level athlete. It's not a lot of times that wrestlers get brought into, you know, headquarters, like, sat down with some of the marketing team, and able to be involved with kind of the niche of, of creating shoes, marketing shoes, branding things, and and selling them. And so they brought me in, treated me like a high-level athlete. 
and it's been great. So talk about your involvement with design, color choice, all the things that go into making up something you do want to put your name on. Yeah, that's that's tough sometimes because what I like doesn't always appeal to the masses. And so that's always a, a difficult position to be in is, okay, well, I like these and I think I'd look good in this. But essentially, will 200,000 kids that buy these shoes look good in these? And so I have to wear the product. But I want to put something out there that not only they'll enjoy, but that I feel comfortable in. So if I'm going to wear it, I want to feel good in it. I want to wrestle at the highest level in it. And so if they know that I'm wrestling and competing in it, then it's definitely going to work for the young men and women. Um, and it's been great. It's been great. I think the relationship we've established has been awesome. We have a, a mutually beneficial relationship. And I really appreciate everything they've done for me. And I look forward to moving forward with the ACES Corporation. It's been a great relationship. In terms of shoes, what are the, the most important elements to you as an athlete? What, what was most important for you to see in the shoe? I'd say style and comfort are the two biggest uh, just characteristics of a shoe that I want to be involved with and that I want to have my name on, essentially. And so when you see the ASICS shoe, the ASICS logo is big, but there's also a Jordan Burrow signature on that wrestling shoe. And so I want to create a product that I stand behind. And if I wear it, I want it to be of high quality and I want to look good while doing so. And so my high school coach used to always tell me, if you look good, then you feel good. And if you feel good, you wrestle good. And so you start with what you have on and then obviously your training, the way your nutrition has been leading up to an event, and then your mindset from looking good and feeling good and from your preparation is the mindset to go out and compete at a high level and hopefully win. So your shoes are available at some of the nation's top Retailers of wrestling product, that would be yeah. a given, I would suppose. Guys like Takedown uh, Sportswear in Atlanta, Georgia, or sure. um, uh, All American Wrestling, All -American wrestling Supply, uh, and then, of course, many others uh, would want to forget Sunflower, but those are, those are natural. Um, now they're in big box stores. You're seeing them on Amazon.com. You're seeing them in uh, the East Bay catalog. You're seeing them in so many different places. Did you ever imagine? that your name affiliated with a product and a product line would be that widespread and that available to that many people. I don't think you can ever imagine that you'd be as successful as you dream to be. And so as a young man, I just wanted to win a lot of wrestling matches. I never understood quite what it would entail to be a successful wrestler because I'm kind of in uncharted water, uncharted territory. And so I think of some of the greats before me that were highly marketable athletes. So obviously, Kale Sanderson and Henry Cejudo, Brandon Slay, all these guys that had wrestling shoes in the 21st century. But then also guys like John Smith, who was extremely successful, but it was before an era of social media. It was before an era of the internet and high marketability. And so to have friends from back at home walk into Sports Authority or Dick's Sporting Goods or Shields, any of these places and see not only my wrestling shoe, but a poster of me in the wrestling shoe aisle of such big box retail stores is unbelievable, indescribable. I love it. I love it. I appreciate it. I'm extremely grateful for it. But, you know, there's been a lot of work. It's been a lot of work to, it's not like they just were like, hey, bro, has you ever wrestled before? Okay, great. You can have your own shoe. Like, it's been a lot of work that's been going into this, uh, just this opportunity that I've created. And so we kind of create these opportunities for ourselves through years of hard work. And then to have such a large corporation recognize it and want to get behind it is, uh, is I'm very happy, very thankful. Do you think that uh, you, you shouldn't be able to get a signature shoe unless you have Olympic gold medal? Um, No, I don't think so. Because if you look at the guys in the NBA, I mean, look at the guys that have shoes. I think of Blake Griffin, Kevin Durant, uh, Carmelo Anthony, Chris Paul, all these guys that have never won an NBA championship, but they are highly marketable athletes, you know, and they're it, realistically, if you had only guys that won the big show have shoes, then it'd be unfair to everyone else because there are guys who are marketable guys who are, are great in the sport, but you shouldn't have to, we're already in a performance based incentive driven sport. You have to win practically a world championship to get a large substantial check at the end of the season. And so it's, it's, it's too much of that. If you look at all the other professional sports, there are a lot of guarantees. You know, a lot of guarantees for guys that not based on 
what they've done, but based on potential. So you don't market someone based on their accomplishments. You market them based on their potential to, to have accomplishments and to do cool things. And so when I think of guys like Kyle Dake and David Taylor and Jordan Oliver and Ed Ruth, all these young guys that are studs that have the potential to be great at some period of time, but people love them. People enjoy them. Kids want to be like them. Parents love watching them and inviting them to their camps to teach technique to their young men and women. And so I think it's necessary. I, can't, I don't think you can really pigeonhole it because essentially I'd be the only guy or myself and Varner would be the only guy with wrestling shoes. I, think, um, I, I totally agree with you. I think that's where our sport has lacked in the past because it, it has been. You win Olympic gold and you get a shoe. Right. That's really kind of how it's been. But now you know you see yeah, David, David Taylor's signature shoe with Adidas is blown up. So I think I think that's great. And it keeps people – Well, you need, yeah, you need some competitiveness. You need competitiveness and you need uh, – you need options. You need variety. You need yeah, but Carmelo Anthony really? Yeah, but he, I mean he's a, he's a he's a good athlete. He's a good athlete at the end of the day, and I think um, you want comp you want competition. You know, it, it's bringing money into the pockets and, and bringing resources to wrestling. Either a, Asics they don't need, they don't need these guys. Adidas they don't need these guys, but they want to put money in these guys' pockets and align themselves with them to create a greater good for wrestling as a whole. Okay. And so they could take David Taylor's name off the Matt Wizards and they'd still sell. But with his name on it, it makes it a more marketable shoe. And essentially, he's making thousands of dollars from it. So I'm, I'm, I'm for it. I'm All definitely right. for it. All right, let's, uh, let's switch gears, Hager. You ready? We're going to go to last time we saw uh, Jordan Burroughs in action was in September, I do believe. And uh, when will the next time we see you in action? When, what, what is uh, your next scheduled date? I will be at the Yasar Dogu in Istanbul, Turkey, and I believe it's February 9th or 10th. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on the dates, but it's some time in that period of of uh, of dates. And so I'll be back there. Myself, James Green are going to go out and travel together, train and compete at that same event, and then prepare for the Olympic trials. And so this is a big year for me. You know, the expectations are are high now. Everyone knows who I am. They expect me to win. They expect me to perform at a high level, go out, dominate, win another Olympic gold medal. And so and I think about those things, and now I have to put myself in position to do those things. Dan Lobdell, often known as the Wrestling Nomad on Twitter and his other handles uh, out there as well, uh, has been invited to be I've a part that. of I've seen that name yeah. on Twitter, actually. Very good writer. Uh, but asked him to pen five questions that we could ask you. And yeah. the first one is, how do you feel about Foxcatcher 2.0 or a Super Olympic Training Center? Does that give the America the best chance to be best in the world? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know if you guys have had the opportunity to read my latest blog um, about American wrestling and kind of where we've been in the last 20 to 25 years and kind of our, our fall from grace. I think in the late 80s, early 90s, we were a powerhouse. You know, I think back to... 96, where we had Tom Brands and Kendall Cross, Kurt Angle, Bruce Baumgartner, uh, Kenny Monday, Townsend Saunders, all these amazing wrestlers that were bringing home medals regularly to now at the point where we're just hoping that we can bring home some medals each year. And the expectations aren't very high. We're just hoping for the best. And so how do we go from that point in our history where we were a dominant world power to being relegated to outside of the top five. I mean, the only reason we were able to wrestle in the World Cup this past year was because we were the host, you know, because we placed outside of the top eight this past year. And so that's a bummer for me. I don't want to be regarded as a seventh place team. I think it's completely unacceptable. And the resources that we spend and put into our program don't bring the results that they should. And so I think a Foxcatcher 2.0 is – just this grand showcase of all our best wrestlers, like this huge think tank, think tank where we've got all the facilities that we need. Obviously, a standalone facility, a number, numerous wrestling mats. We've got a sauna, a massage therapist, a physical therapist, um, strength and conditioning coaches. We've got multiple freestyle coaches full time that aren't dedicated to folk style for six months out of the season, where they're full time freestyle coaches. We've got twenty to twenty five guys who are all high level guys. I'm talking the top two or three guys at each weight class, not kind of, kind of not middle of the road guys. I mean, the, the best guys our country has to offer, the best coaches. And I think we need this camaraderie and this consolidation to really 
get this country going as a whole. We're too compartmentalized. I just think about the best guys are in so many different RTCs, so many different places, and these resources are only being individualized into these little pockets of wrestling throughout the country. But if we could bring these resources together, create a living wage for the wrestlers who are actually interested in going to this Foxcatcher 2.0, I think it could be huge. Essentially, for America moving forward, we got a lot of young guys who are hungry and chopping at the bit to get an opportunity to kind of create a resurgence in this country's ability to win medals yearly. And right, so, right. so I, I, I want to lead that charge. I hope that I can be a part of it. I don't want it to kind of be one of those things like, all right, I initiated it, but I missed the train because I was a little too old. But I think it's something that before I step off the mat in Tokyo in 2020, like I want to have this thing in order and I want to be a part of it. And so whether the location's in Lincoln, Nebraska, Philadelphia, PA, Los Angeles, California, or Miami, Florida, wherever the location is to be agreed upon, I think this needs to be something where all wrestlers from throughout the country leave their allegiances and their alliances with their alma maters and say, all right, this is for the greater good of the country. I love the University of Nebraska, and it, I'll never root or cheer or be aligned with any other collegiate program, but at the end of the day, the U.S. is what's most important to me. You know, and so over the red, I'm a bigger fan of the red, white, and blue. Um, and, you know, I, essentially, I think that's that's necessary for people to be in. And I think it's got to be a a, a a collaborative effort from a number of people. Whether we can do it or not is still yet to be determined, but I think it's possible. I think it's on a lot of people's minds that, you know, why do we not have that right now? I mean, was, was that such a tragic event? Because it... Foxcatcher was still around after that happened. There were still wrestlers getting paid through that, um, you know, that portal, I guess. So I think it's it's a great that somebody like yourself that has led the charge and you know marketing and changing our sport and social media to to bring this up on your blog. And it's great to know that you also don't care where it's at. It could be in Iowa, Missouri. Yeah, it, for it sure. just needs to be somewhere that it's agreed it just upon. Needs to be somewhere, like you said, it's got to be. It's just got to exist. And so, but the, I mean, the biggest thing for us probably is, is the resources. You know, can we create a place where there are 25 guys who can get paid, I don't know, $50,000 a year or $35,000 a year, whatever the number is, um, is unnecessary and that could be figured out later. But can we get the resources in place to create this training site with full-time freestyle training coaches that are of high quality, that are more interested in helping the U.S. than they are an individual collegiate program and that freestyle is foremost in their minds over folk style you know can we create that um i think it's necessary i think it's absolutely necessary because you know at the end of the day guys are making money but we're not winning you know it's like what, what do you want do you want a lot of wrestlers to be able to support their families or do you want to bring home a lot of medals you know and so i say this selfishly i want to win a world championship on a world championship team Let's just say that this is not not already established by 2020 Tokyo. You you step away from the mat competitively. Do you think this could be a role that you see yourself in, or would you Absolutely. like to coach at a, co- a collegiate level? No, I w- I'd like free. I want to win world and Olympic gold medals as a country. You know, so whatever is necessary for me to do and to put myself in the position to help this country get to that place where we were back in the 90s. I think uh, I, I want to be a part of that. I really want to be a part of that. And so I love folk style. It's, it, what's, it's what fuels this country, and it's what most wrestling fans know. Um, but at the end of the day, the most important style, to me personally, maybe this is a personal preference. Maybe I say this selfishly, but I like freestyle. And I think freestyle is most important because it's the highest level. A lot of people say, okay, wrestling's wrestling. You get a takedown, it's two points regardless of style. But there are different freestyle-specific feels that you can't get from a collegiate wrestler no matter how often you wrestle or no matter how tough they are. And I think that's absolutely necessary. We need these feels on a daily basis, like every single day. We need structure. It's not just feel, it's structure. There's no freestyle program that has a fully aligned program where they have a whole team. Like at Nebraska, we have 35 guys in our program. They practice every single day. They've got a lifting coach. We've got four assistant coaches. Like imagine if we had that for eight months 
in preparation for the trials and for the Olympic Games or for the World Championships, like how good of a team we'd be if we had that type of structure. But most of the guys are out here just practicing folk style and showing up at these tournaments and hoping that what they already knew is going to work. Like, it doesn't work like that. You've got to continue to evolve and learn. You can't just wrestle with these guys and teach. The, like, how can you learn if you're always teaching? You know what I mean? Like, there are a bunch of young guys in the room. You need guys at equal, similar, or at a higher level than you are to get to the next level. And I, I think it's necessary. So I'm just trying to find it. The question is, how do you find it? And who's willing to, you know, to, to align themselves with people to do this? And it's got to be a, a neutral site. It's got to be absolutely neutral. It can't be aligned with any collegiate program. Like, okay, we got Penn State. He's got this million-dollar donor. He's going to donate $5 million to this program. But you guys have to do it here at Penn State. And that's going to cause a lot of friction because people don't want to represent Penn State. They don't want to be a part of the Nittany Lion Wrestling Club. Like, it's got to be something absolutely neutral where its focus is just for freestyle and for the United States of America. Jordan Burroughs has been our guest. Uh, Jordan, final question we have for you. Uh, you wake up every day. Yeah. Comes a sudden realization of who you are. What is your mindset in the morning? Um, how's mom feeling? And where's Beacon? <laughs> What's he? <laughs> um, you know, so that mindset has shifted a ton in the last couple of years, man. Every year is my life's different. My life changes, and so I think about 2012. Um. You know, I was I was single and I had no worries. The only thought of process I had when I woke up was how do I become a better wrestler today and ensure myself an Olympic gold medal. 2013, I was engaged and I was planning to be married and I broke my ankle. And so that was a tough transition in the dynamic of my life at that time. 2014, I was married. I had a little boy heading into the world championships, tore my MCL in the first match and lost to Sargush. And so I'm like, crap, well, how do I get back to prominence? So 2015, I have a little boy. He's a little bit older. You know, my wife, we're getting a stronger relationship. And so, like, the dynamics of our life shifted a little bit where we were kind of settling into what we needed to do. And now, leading forward, I'm like, how do I create a legacy where I become legendary in this sport? Like, what can I do to really set myself apart from all of my opponents? Like, I don't want to be, and I say this, maybe this is egotistical or self-serving or pretentious, but, like, I want to be not only the best ever, but I want to do everything the best. Like I want to, I want to sell the most wrestling shoes. I want to have the coolest singlets. Like I want to do the coolest documentaries. I want to score the most points, win the most medals. Like I want to do everything that I do that involves the sport of wrestling. I feel like not only should I do it best, but it's absolutely necessary that I do it best because of my talents and my thought process. Um, and so I, I think about that stuff. And so my wife and I were always sitting down. Um, and I meet with a number of people here in Lincoln that are kind of mentors of mine. And we're always having just these days where we just bounce ideas off each other. Like, what do we do? How do we get this? How do we, how do we earn without earning? You know, how do we get to a place where I don't have to go out and shoot double legs to make a living? You know, just things like that. Just the small details um, that are significant now because I'm really setting myself up for the transition out of wrestling. But at this point, I want to win more. This is a huge Olympics for me. This right here, this 2016 Olympic Games in Rio de Janeiro is the most important tournament of my life. Um, and, I, and I feel that pressure and I feel those expectations. Um, but, you know, the good thing about expectations is most people rise to them. You got to rise to the occasion to, to do special stuff. And, and that's why I'm here. You know, that's why we're doing this interview. And that's why I'm a favorite is because was, I've been able to do those things and to kind of deflect the pressure to the magnitude of the moment and just knowing that this is a great opportunity that God's presented me with. And I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm training hard. I took like a week off after the world championships. And so I feel like I'm still in great shape. I'm still learning. I'm still in a good position mentally. And I'm very hungry, very hungry to be an Olympic champion once again. And so the opportunities for me have been extremely awesome like i've got a number of sponsorships endorsements like i've done i just did a photo shoot with time magazine on sunday like all these crazy things that i'm able to do but with those you know opportunities comes responsibility They're like okay now we've given you all this money we've taken all these pictures of you you got to deliver uh so i don't know if a lot of people can handle that type of pressure but i thrive under it and i'm excited um 
to go out and try to represent my country to the best of my ability. So right now I'm happy. Um, my family's blessed. They're all healthy. And I really have the opportunity to become a legend in the sport by winning a second gold medal. Gosh, are we lucky. Lucky indeed to have a man like Jordan Burroughs do what he's doing in such a way where others not only notice, but he's doing it the right way. JB, it's always good to talk to you, bud. Happy holidays. And Loa, dare I say it, Merry Christmas. Yeah, for sure. I'll accept it. <laughs> Best gift under the tree this year. Bucks. And uh, I think Amazon will probably back me up on sales figures. But Asics yeah. shoes, the JB Elite Wrestling shoes, are flying off the shelves. Make sure you make your choice and put those shoes under the uh, tree for your kids this year or that wrestler in your life. Jordan, thanks for the time. Best to Lauren and Beacon. We love you, brother. Keep doing what you're doing, man. All right. I appreciate that, man. Thank you very much for the call. And uh, go USA. We'll see you on Ric Flair night. Yeah, for sure, my man. Can we get a woo out of you? Yeah, for sure. Woo! That's what I'm talking about. Jordan Burroughs. <laughs>